Welcome to the Independent Artist Podcast, sponsored by the National Association of Independent Artists. Also sponsored by Zapplication. I'm Will Armstrong, and I'm a mixed media artist. I'm Douglas Sigworth, glassblower. Join our conversations with professional working artists. Art show artists, artists, art directors, folks out there listening, welcome back to the podcast. Hey guys, how's it going? Douglas, you've been out there on the road again. You were down in Gasparilla soaking in the sunlight and uh, hoping to pick up on some of that fat, fat prize money that is lingering down in Tampa area of Florida. How did it go? Well, that prize money escaped us. We did not get our hands on any of that, but we had a good time. It was not our best selling event. We kind of had a bit of a reality check, okay. a little bit of the boom and then the bust to kind of keep us feeling a little humble. Keep you honest. <laughs> it always keeps you honest whenever you think you got to figure it out. Yeah, yeah. But there are some good potentials. We met with a gallery and they placed a nice order for this year. And we had some big interest that might pull through later. So, you know, this business is not all right up front. Sometimes we're planting seeds and this felt like a seed planting weekend for <laughs> planting us. Planting seeds and laying eggs. <laughs> all right. It looked like it was hot as hell, was it? A lot of people complained about it. Maybe where we were at, it didn't feel too bad. But I will remind everyone that I am a glass blower. I'm pretty good with heat. <laughs> but some people did act very much like it was record heat. And I'm like, really? This is this doesn't feel so bad. But yeah, um, it no, it, it, it was that was the complaint. It was a hot one. I always feel like a rat in a cage when there's no shade, and you know you're hanging mm -hmm. on to the the corner of the shade of your booth, and somebody will walk in and be like, "Well, you've got some nice shade." I'm like, "Lady, I." <laughs> brought it. You know, it's not like I'm under a big oak tree. The only shade is this freaking canopy, my dirty craft hut. <laughs> you know, and a lot of us glass blowers, we like to be aimed right at the sun, but we weren't aimed directly at the sun. Hmm. My good friend Mark Suddeth had sun the entire weekend and his glass was sparkling and shining. So I'm sure it was pretty hot over there. You know, by this time, Douglas, the award winners will probably have been compiled into a list. I haven't seen it. I mean, I've seen the big prize money, but not a list on some of the, the small awards. Yeah, we're recording a couple days after the show, and they did not have a full list published right now. But we know of the big winner was Nanika Jones for her amazing work. I loved seeing the photos of somebody new on the scene with work that is that fully realized with their vision and with their booth that they can win a top prize like the the Gasparilla $15,000 award. That'll keep her going for a little bit. So congratulations. Was really inspired to see some new work and to see something so inspired. To see somebody so young. I think she's, I think she's early 20s. Awesome. And I mentioned to her that I was so inspired by one of the big murals she made. And she said, which one? So she's already got a huge body of work behind her. She's got big pieces on the sides of buildings. She's got a real presence and she is going to take the world by storm. I'm really excited by what she's doing. Yeah, sounds like she already is. We talk a mm. lot about that and, and trying to get new artists on the scene involved in our shows. So it's it's really yeah. exciting to me to, to see somebody kind of come in and kick the doors in and maybe kick a bunch of our old asses. <laughs> <laughs> Her website is artyouhungry.com, by the way. And what I'm inspired also is not just the subject matter of her work, but I mean, she's working in mixed media. So she's doing this embroidery in with painting and it's just so cool. She's definitely making statements about society, about her culture. Check it out when you get time if you aren't familiar with Nanika Jones's artwork. Yeah, my first instinct was um, like, oh, man, here's this emerging artist. And I've been involved with NAIA with emerging artists. So I'm like, maybe I should oh. talk to her. I'm like, she didn't need any help. Maybe she should talk to you. <laughs> you know? She is... She's not emerging. No. <laughs> she's young, but she has she knows what she's doing. Yeah. She doesn't do many of the, uh, the art shows. I think Gasparilla being in her hometown, but she's done a lot of other shows. And I would like the opportunity to sit down and chat with her. So I'm going to I'm going to put a bug in her ear and see if she would come come talk to us on the podcast. Right on. I'd look forward to, to hearing that talk for sure. All right, Douglas, that takes us to uh, another thing on the docket. I've been uh, sitting around. I have not been doing shows. One of the things that I'm um, my wife and I are watching one of these Apple 
TV shows that is on. It's called The Servant. That's like an M. Night Shyamalan thing, a horror-ish. But I'm mm. sitting there watching this show with her, and I'm looking at the neighborhood, and the entire show is filmed in the Rittenhouse Square neighborhood. So if you're a fan of that show and you love going around nice. walking in that neighborhood... Um, it just kind of blew me away. I was like, ah, I've been there. I've been there. It's just, <laughs> I know that place. Yeah. <laughs> so some of those really cool, tall row houses uh, that are there, the, the main characters live in one of the, the big fancy one, ones of those. So if you're a fan of that show and you like uh, like that kind of stuff, uh, give it a shot. Check it out. A uh, good way to keep yourself connected. Well, you're not at shows, but I know you just had yourself a nice week of recharging the batteries. I did, man. Uh, new studio, new space. And mm-hmm. um, I actually got that thing set up, got the got the blinds hung and the easel put in, my big box of paint set up on my table. I'm ready to go. Okay, nobody can see you right now. They can hear how excited you are. Your face is like glowing. Your uh, <laughs> eyes are going to twinkle in it. You are I'm just I'm ready to get to work, man. I <laughs> am ready to just kick it into gear. And I've kind of been a little stagnant. And I needed this to uh, kind of get me going. Um, I've got low ceilings in the in the room in our home that I have been working. It's like a former garage, like attached to the house. And, mm. and I, I just I can't crank the easel up the where I where I want. I'm, I'm if I'm working on like a six foot by four foot horizontal, if I've got it, I'm working all the way at the bottom of the piece. Then I I actually have to get down on my knees. <laughs> it's it's like a one of those obstacle course type things you're trying to paint. Yeah, over it's like this doesn't work. It does This sounds perfect. Right, and I'm not the youngest anymore. I've got you know back issues and things like that. And I don't know. It's it's good to get out there and, and stretch out and, and make some new work. I'm going. Much larger this year. I've already done some pretty big things. I've got, uh, I just got commissioned for a big one in Park City that I'm excited about. And uh, cool. yeah, ready to ready to crank out some work. So I believe you were uh, looking into ordering up one of those big, tall transits too, so you can fit some of that nice big Fuck work in. You, you what? know, uh, what? What? Th- uh, they literally will not take my money. Are you transit t- is shut off. Did they just? I, I, I missed it by five days. Oh, I'm fuck. not even kidding. I, I've been kind of like dragging my feet, and all you have to do is put down your thousand dollars. And I built out my dream transit. I sent it to the guy. Yeah, and he's like, "Yeah, it looks good." And then I wanted to actually sit down with the the dealer guy, uh, the car salesman, and make sure I was missing things or ordering too much. And it was like. I don't know. I'd gotten a little lazy because I knew it was going to be six or eight months. And I was excited that I'd be getting this, you know, in time for like the fall show season. Mm -hmm. The 2022 is shut off. So if you want a new transit. Redesigning a whole different vehicle or uh, I'm sure just the supply and demand or what's the deal? eh, You don't know. I'm sure they put a new cigarette lighter in it or something, but uh, (laughs) call it the 23. But yeah, the 2022s are done. They're not taking any more orders. And not only that, I went through the whole process right up to the point where you plop down a thousand dollar bill and hold your place. Yeah. And they were like, um, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Which thousand dollar bill, oddly, that is my hip hop name. So uh, just, <laughs> just sure. aside, <laughs> just if you see that around. No, but seriously, when, you, when it comes down to it, they would not take my money. They're like, yeah, I'm sorry. We, we, we can't take your money. And the car salesman was like, you know, he looked like he'd been shell shock. I don't oh. think that had ever happened to him. Yeah. They're like, that's not our model. Our model is you want it. Yeah. We'll take your money and we'll get it going for you. Right. And, you know, you you can find some used ones. And I just, you know, I wanted to get the the new thing and, and start brand new. And Well, trust me, you buy a used one now, it's more than if you can find one. We all mm-hmm. know what I went through last year. But if you can find one, it's more than buying it brand new and exactly to the specifications you want. So I can see why... I was on their website too. And it's like, you check this box, you check back that box. Do you want the EcoBoost? Do you want the this, the that? It can be a long process of, of going through the menu list of items and then to get to the end of it and be like, sorry, you can't do this. Must be just super frustrating. I don't know. It was just a head scratcher. I yeah. left the, I'm like, I, I have a blank check in my wallet and I can't give it to Ford. Like they won't take it. Uh, <laughs> like 
righteous. So if you're thinking about building out uh, 2022, you missed the boat. So last time we talked, actually, this had happened. I just hadn't talked to you about it. God dang but, it. Um, well, anyway, just so weird. Like the, by the second month of the year, you can't build out one for that year because of all the delays. We were walking to our booth and I saw a, a red transit coming our way. And I said, Renee, Renee, Will ordered one of them. Will's getting one just uh, like that. He's no, not. I was wrong. Not. He might. It might be a 23, though, by the time I do it. All right. Hey, did you see on social media the crazy winds out in California last weekend? Dude, I did. That was heartbreaking. I hated, hated seeing that. I was thinking about, like, our friends Amy and Phil Fobot. Yeah. They went all the way out from Raleigh. Oh. For a big show in California, you know, I mean, they're driving for days and days and days and, and get there. And then they, you know, it's knocking people down and destroying work. They had to cancel Saturday for the show. So heartbreak all around. I know it. Um, I talked to Daryl Thetford and he was talking about how he had knocked, you know, they suggest rebar down into the ground and hammering yeah. this rebar in in order for for support instead of weight. And he had hammered all In that. addition to weight. Yeah. I mean, we do. He was yeah. saying that the, his pro panels were just folded in half at the rebar. Like mm. the rebar held and his everything was just down. But luckily his work, he said, is like concrete. So it's, you know, it's totally sturdy and he didn't lose any work. But oh, the that's pro good. Panels, he had to, I sent out some texts to, to people just to do the check-in. Because there were, there was a lot of photos online. And of course, you know, I thought it was bad if, for them to cancel on a Saturday. But then somebody posted an actual video of what kind of winds they were dealing with. That and I'm was like, insane. that was insane. <laughs> it yeah. was insane. <laughs> yeah. I don't, and there were tents up. Like you, you look mm. up at the top of the palm tree and the palm tree is just like, you know, just whipping. whipping. And then, it was nuts. Yeah. yeah. So uh, apparently uh, Sunday was gangbusters. So hopefully mm -hmm. you guys made it up um, for that. But well, that comes to mind. You know, I've had this conversation with a lot of artists at other shows. We've been at Fort Worth when they've shut down on a big busy day. I think it was a Saturday one time. And people would often comment, oh, it would have been a great show if I would have had that day closed or whatever. I sometimes feel like our customers, they don't live in a bubble or a vacuum. They look at the weather and think, which day of the four days or three days of the show am I going to go? Hmm. And I think, you know what I mean? So I've heard from some folks that the Sunday was gangbusters because anyone who wasn't going to go on Saturday is like, I'm going to make sure I get there tomorrow. Right. So it kind of gets pushed off to one of the other days. It kind of depends on what you have. Like if you have a, a body of work that relies on a sheer volume of people, you just oh, can't, true. you know, you can't cram that many people into the street. So I, you know, if I'm averaging per day, if, if I miss a show, I, uh, if I'm selling and I, I, I don't know, I've got reproductions, but I only, I only uh, bring them out like twice a year. But yeah. if I have, if I miss a day on one of those reproduction shows, then I'm kind of screwed. Yeah. And I guess people can only wait so long. You're one person and you're say you're, you're involved in a conversation with somebody who's going to invest in a nice sizable piece to get through that entire conversation, you can't like, juggle between two, three couples that might be ha wanting to have that same conversation. Yeah. So that can be tricky, too, to get it all in one one time frame. Douglas, you and I have been talking a lot about shows, and I know one of the uh, kind of hiccups – I say hiccups, but this is a pretty pretty major blow. Um, you, you're, you're dealing with some health issues. You've, you've got uh, got some foot and, and leg things that you've been, been putting off. All the friends I saw this weekend in at Gasparilla, the first thing they notice is me hobbling across the, across the way. And my favorite uh, comment, I can't remember who it came from, but they said to me, you really just want to be like Will, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. I wouldn't put that on anybody, man. I'm really sorry. No. That's... So, yeah. No, I am battling an issue with my right foot. And it's a congenital thing. I've, I was born with issues with, with bones, how they were formed. And I knew that when I was old someday, it was going to result in some kind of a bone fusion surgery for me to be able okay. to, to move through space on these feet of mine. And... You know, I've had varying degrees of pain throughout the years, and I just thought what I was experiencing recently was just another flare-up that I just needed to rest and relax. But the x-rays say that I have a surgery on the horizon that I'm just going to have to deal with. So it brings up mm. all those things to mind with being in a career that requires us to be extremely physical. It's 
puts your head into a total tailspin. Yeah. God, our script writers suck, Douglas. <laughs> They do. Right at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, we have the worst script writers. Is it sweeps? Like, no. Is it sweep season or something? It is. It's sweeps. It's getting right into the spring show season. It's time for one of us to go down. It was almost exactly a year ago that you were that that flounder flopping around on a dock. Exactly, man. I'm so so sorry. That sucks. And uh, hats off to Renee if uh, she needs help. You got a, a a mountain of support out here in this community, and and you can both lean on on us. We will we'll take care of you. You'll be all right. Yeah. So um, I'm going to try and get through the show season, uh, looking into what kind of equipment I can use. I'm going to have some foot bracing. I'm going to probably be getting one of those crazy, uh, not a knee cart. It's actually going to look a lot like a Jay McDougal peg leg. It's uh, uh, it's one of those. That's, fa- that's fancy. You making good money. <laughs> <laughs> what they showed me was basically like I bend at the knee and I put my knee down onto this peg leg that straps onto my leg. So that's probably how I'm going to be moving around the studio for a little while. Mm. Sounds pretty, pretty crazy. <laughs> run, Forrest, run. run, Forrest. God, that's brutal. <laughs> so just trying to keep a positive attitude. But after a long, crazy breakdown, and we all know that. The Gasparilla breakdowns are not the easiest of breakdowns. Um, anyway, uh, after that one. Have you ever thought, I've thought about this a lot. Yep. Like, um, I would love to do a show like where the breakdown is really hard and, and we don't need to, you know, we did just say a show by name, but, you know, we all know the shows where things are micromanaged and you you come in one way and you have to do the other and they do radio people. Is this clear? Is this? Yeah. Like. Okay, and then, you know, by midnight, everybody is finally broken down and out of the park. Yeah. Do you ever wonder what it would be like if you just didn't do anything? Open the floodgates and let them in. Just open the gate, and then we work with each other. We do this shit every weekend. I'll I'll play the devil's advocate on that one, because one of the problems that was causing, at least in our neck of the woods, I was in the van stuck in the parking lot while we were all in a bottleneck trying to get untangled. But there was a bottleneck with not that many vehicles on the show site where two artists kind of pull nose to nose. No one can get by each other, booths on either side, and it basically created a traffic jam in the show that couldn't get untangled until their booths were completely loaded up and in the van. So that's what ended up holding up a big section of our side of the show anyway. Was it artist like just a couple of jerks or like I, I don't know the details, but I'm just responding to the point of you saying if just let us figure it out. I think there's just enough people who don't know how to figure it out who hmm. who can just create these these bottlenecks next. And I will say that this show used to have a super micromanaged exit with like you had to get assigned a time that you could pull in to get out. They don't do that anymore. They do it more reasonably where you get your you're, when you're broken to the ground, you get your loadout shit and you go get in line. And when there's a spot that you can pull in, they, they walkie talkie you in. But one of the problems that this show was dealing with this year, and a lot of shows are dealing with this year is the issue of volunteers. They just can't get the amount of volunteers that they need to to help. Interesting. And so I wonder what's bringing volunteers down. I mean, I know that um, millennials don't want to work. Well, yeah, we've got that. (laughs) You know, here's my okay. Here's my favorite breakdown. Sure. All right. Yeah. I do like break it down, break it down to nothing and get a pass. Mm-hmm. Go get in line and, and come in. Yeah. I mean, that that seems to work. It seems to wean out the slower people. They can take their time. Like me. Okay. Me. Yeah. <laughs> right. Get your get your pet. Break it down to nothing. Take a picture of your booth. Show the person. Get your pass. Go get in line. Get the pop and up jewelers at, out of there. Yeah. You let them out of your way. Because mm-hmm. if I've got a pop up jeweler uh, out of my way, if they can throw all of their stuff into a suitcase and wheel out of there, then all of a sudden that's double parking for you and me. Our totally. Big right. So anyway. Okay, get your thing. Then you got, uh, if there's room, you have one row of parking, and then you have one row of driving. Keep an, a thing clear. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's all you need. Yeah. Well, one of the, and maybe if any one of the show is listening out there, uh, that they would maybe work on for next year is that the artist parking, which is great. I mean, it's not too far from the show. It's manageable. But it's completely gated around, and there's only one way to get out. And so when you've got... 
about 6.30, all the artists are completely broken down and everyone's in their van trying to get out of this little narrow exit. And you don't have staff to do the, you come now, you go there, you go, and you know what I mean, and direct. You've got everybody stuck in the parking lot and nobody can get out. So that's kind of what was one of the, the challenges. But we all got out of there. We weren't there till three in the morning and, you know, all is well. How late were you there? Uh, we were there till about 10. Shoot me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want. You don't want. I, don't, I just kept I saying, Lot H. I'm sitting there, Lot H. Lot H. Ah, mm. Lot H. <laughs> That's, I don't, I don't want. Yeah. I feel like everything, you know, everybody's a little bit on edge still from COVID. What are you and talking about? They're, <laughs> right. And they're coming out of their shells. They're coming, you know, it's, it's, a, things are harder at the grocery store. Things are, one thing that I have noticed with my wife and her dealings is the demanding customers are coming out of the woodwork. Mm. Like, like I got somebody last night, I'm on the couch, you know, I had a long, hard day. We just made dinner. We had an incredible dinner, sat down or watching something on TV. And I get a text from a client that wants to zoom. Right. Like at 830 at night. We realize we don't fit the nine to five model, but exactly. Yeah. We do have personal lives. I got texts and emails from a customer the other day. Exactly. Like this was like their house was burning down or something. It's an art emergency. She wanted to Zoom last night at nine o'clock. And since I, I did not respond to that, I was like, yeah, no, absolutely not. I mean, you know how hard it is just to get me on the phone. Like, I don't want to do it. I, <laughs> I talk to you already people. have an we, aversion to the phone. I do. I can't stand it. We've got this whole podcast by text thing down. We can usually know what the other one's <laughs> thinking from about three words. <laughs> right. But this like this cl same client, like if I'm not available last night, she wanted to. This is like pre eight o'clock in the morning. I'm like, yeah. do you really want to talk to me? Like, I haven't had coffee. Are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a super good idea. So. I honestly, I will say that my kids are in their 20s and I saw this starting in their generation back when they were preteens about your kids' age and I would see the stress and the anxiety on their faces when we'd be at the dinner table and I'd say put your phone away and their phone would vibrate and they'd be like but they're going to my friends are going to get so mad at me if I don't respond right and Weird, it would yeah. seem so foreign to me this was 10 years ago so foreign of a concept to me that you couldn't just be like busy or your your parents could have grounded you or you could whatever. But the, the emotional stress, and I feel like now, 10 years later, it's become the norm across generations that we have a thought and we want an answer right now. Yeah. Uh, immediate gratification. And it, it, what my wife is finding, too, is like people will Instagram message her. Mm. And then if, if they don't get an immediate response, it's like 10 minutes later, it's an email, then a text, then a phone call. It's like you're trying to pick out a diamond. You're not trying, yeah. to, you know. This isn't like, this isn't world hunger. It's not Ukraine. It's, isn't it funny? Uh, the natural reaction of people is, well, I just wanted to be sure you got my text. Well, <laughs> what, why would yeah. you think I wouldn't get it? You think right. I have a secret I, number or something? <laughs> yeah. That, well, that brings me to another one that always cracks me up when you go onto like one of the, the, the social artist pages and be like, has anyone heard from X? And they're like, yeah, I did. They, they gave me my booth number, my uh, load-in packet. Uh, Douglas is reading it for me. And they told Bullshit. us not to tell you. They only gave it. <laughs> I've already dropped you a pin to the parking lot. But anyway, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, right? Like, right. like yeah, they, they let all of us know. But but you, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, you're not. They, they said, don't. Don't tell Steve. Yeah. That's that's right. You know, folks, you can go into your search bar and it will look through your junk mail. It'll look through your trash. It'll find an email that you might be looking for that you might have been missing from a particular show. <laughs> That's a little insight into you and your anxiety, I think. Uh, You're like, maybe it's here. Maybe it's over there. Well, it's like, I don't give a fuck. I'm just going to drive to the city. And if I don't know where to go, I'll text my friends. <laughs> that's, uh, that's how I do. I mean, it's uh, that's just like, how hey, you roll. You well, I just don't. You know, here's here's the only thing I care about. OK, at a show. All right. Right. Don't give me directions. Please don't give me how about directions an address? to where to go. Can you just get just an address? Give me, just give me the address. Yeah. That's all I care about. I don't like, don't tell me to turn down 
fourth street to like get to the texaco and turn right we're not in vermont you know it, it, I, i'm not talking to an old guy this year like just <laughs> freaking tell me what's the address i just want the address that's honestly that's all i care about we all use some form of navigation services we don't need the turn yeah. at the texaco <laughs> jesus christ it's, it's one way here so if you're looking here and then they're coming down the street like i want the address just give me the address i don't don't care. That's what, honestly, that's the only thing in the packet I want. That's the only thing that I'll read. Like, just put one page with the address in like 72 point font. Yep. And that's the only thing I need. And then just a nice it. yard sign at the turn in to where artist check in is. Just that's all we need is a sign that says artist check in. <laughs> you know, I only want one thing, Doug. It's you already just the said address. the one thing, and that was an address. What's that's the it. other one thing you want? That's it. I just said that's just the address. Okay. That's it. Okay. Well, that's, that'll that's that'll turn off. Packet. That'll turn off the cranky Will if you just give him the address, everyone. <laughs> Will's packet, okay. and it's just a big old sheet of paper. Okay. There we go. All right. So. Anything else? Uh, I went on to Zap uh, this morning and I was looking at some stuff and I, I realized they have their annual artist survey and there's mm. some good stuff in there. Similar to the NAIA survey uh, in that they're asking certain questions, what you'd like on Zap, what you use, uh, the different help things. Cool. So they're trying to grow. They're trying to get better. So definitely check that out. Uh, you'll see the link at the very top of their page as soon as you open it on your phone or on your laptop or whatever. I was surprised. Surprised. I didn't know that it, that they were doing that. So um, nice. definitely let your voice be heard and, and get counted there. Yeah. I mean, there's certainly features that might have an idea for something. I can't think of anything off the top of my head right now, but yeah, you know, it's good to let them know. Let them know what's working for you and what's not working for right. you. I mean, and most uh, of the stuff is, is all working. The one thing that I could use on Zap that I put into my survey was that, you know, like you, you can fill in the 100 word, the 200 or the 300. Yeah. I love that. It, for it, it to be automated and you can just say that you don't have to rewrite it every time or go on to a Google Doc and copy and paste. It's just exactly. in there. Yeah, it's right in there. And yeah. so the only other thing that I could use is like sometimes you do these shows where they're like, tell us your thing. And now if you've made it past a certain point, then they read your big artist statement. Mm. There's no place to keep that like unlimited artist statement like mm -hmm. keep it under a thousand words if you can but here's a place mm -hmm. to describe your work more so that would be great mm -hmm. to have that classic um, douglas yeah. style i said i have nothing and now as we're talking i think of something you know the topic yeah. came up last time about artists misrepresenting themselves maybe there could be some kind of profile pick that's considered not part of the application but it's considered part of the about us or whatever in the profile where we have to upload a current accurate photo of ourselves so that the shows can use that as comparison against the cheaters out there so nice just a headshot just a headshot this is perfect me. yeah yeah that's a great idea all right we are at the interview portion of the podcast today i sat down and talked with bronze sculptor kimber feeberger from minneapolis minnesota I've never met her before, so this is a really interesting talk, and I loved uh, the fact that you got to go check out her studio first and, and come in and, and uh, talk about the work. I've seen it uh, hundreds of times just uh, being loaded into shows. and She's prolific. Her work is throughout the country in public squares. It's very popular with different towns, and when I YouTubed her, I mean, she's a good friend of mine. I've known her for years. She, we live in the same area. And so I wanted to look at what was out there. And there's this guy on a bike driving around to different town squares showing these bronzes. And he did that with her. He's like showing all her Humpty Dumpties throughout the country. And it's pretty interesting to see just the spread that she's got out there. Uh, what do you mean he's riding on a, a bike? This is this guy is just a person, just some old person. <laughs> Not an old person, just some guy, some old guy. Just some, who gets on his bike with his camera on and he's riding around the city showing off all the different bronze sculptures in the public oh, square. Gotcha. So he's giving a little tour of he's giving got, a little tour of I'm different imagining cities and him loading uh, all of bronzes and things on the back of his bike. I'm like, what are you talking about? OK, uh, I am a little bit of pain, ladies and gentlemen. It's hard to follow my train of thought. <laughs> I understand. But thank you, Will, for getting me back on track. Yeah. So the whole point was that she is 
everywhere. You know what, Douglas? I have seen Kimber's work uh, at a lot of different art shows, seen it at one of a kind, being pushed by the union guys on cartloads <laughs> with all the little Humpty Dumpties balanced on their shelves. Making them work for yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. They get paid. Might as well uh, take advantage of it. But man, I'm, I'm looking forward to everybody hearing this talk. Okay, here is Kimber Feebigger, bronze sculptor from Minneapolis, Minnesota. This episode of the Independent Artist Podcast is brought to you by Zap, the digital application service where artists and art festivals connect. Well, sometimes I'm in a real hurry, and I just love that I have things that are saved in Zap to streamline my process. Saving shows as favorites is my personal way of using Zap. Uh, that's my favorite. Uh, I know a lot of people use the calendar, they use the events, but for me, if I'm saving the favorites of anything I've ever looked at or thought about doing, then I can check out those deadlines on a regular basis. But then there's other times when I have a little more time on my hands and I'm looking into other shows. All the information is right there in the prospectus with links to the website. I can see who the artists are that have participated in the past. That's a great idea, Douglas, because one of the ways that I was finding shows at the very beginning was to go online and see who I felt my work looked good with. It's just great that all that information is organized and easy to look over when planning our next show season. Are you able to see me okay and we're good? Yeah, 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 right. yep, yep. Got a little stubble, just a tiny bit of stubble. I, right I didn't clean up for you. Sorry about that. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> It looks good. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'm so glad you took some time to talk to me today, Kimber. I know that you are like the busiest person I know. Yeah, it doesn't seem to go away. It doesn't. And I think that's self-imposed, <laughs> wouldn't you say? I would say so. I'm not one to say I'm bored. <laughs> well, we got to your place, which I'm so glad we came to visit because stepping into your world was, it was so cool your gallery, your home, your studio, it is just, it's you. You're everywhere. Yeah, I am living the dream. <laughs> totally. It's, you're so immersed in it. I mean, for one, we're driving down Minneapolis, down the street in downtown Minneapolis by the, by the university, and everything looks the same, looking for your place. And then out of the blue, it's like stucco and bright colors and happy sculptures. And it's just this beautiful site. Tell me all about how that came to be. You know, my whole life, I think that I just wanted to say something. I always had a sense that we're here for such a short period of time. Yeah. And I always had to be different and not be normal. I <laughs> thought normal was kind of boring and had too many limits. So okay. <laughs> the universe well, is wide open when you're a little crazy. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so you want it to be recognizable, stand out, and 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 do your thing. Ironically, I don't like attention, but yeah. I like things that get attention. Mm. I, I don't want it on me personally, but it just kind of inadvertently happens. Yeah, I guess that concept is a little complex. I mean, to think that you like to put that stuff out there maybe for an effect or is it for a reaction, but it's not about you personally, it's about the idea or the thought. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, it's about the idea. It's like you make it and you need a place to put it. And mm -hmm. I, I never want to quit making it. So the ideas keep coming. I don't know what I'm going to do when I run out of space because <laughs> I just don't keep making stuff. And I don't know where I'll go after my house is done. <laughs> I think you have enough work uh, from what we saw this week to go well on into retirement. I think there is just this drive and this need in you to be making. You're spot on. I need my hands in something all the time. Mm -hmm. Back in the days when we used to visit friends before COVID, mm -hmm. I used to always have a balls of clay in my pocket that I was always squishing through my fingers and making tiny little sculptures. And every once in a while, they, my friends would call me, you left your clay ball in my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> so uh some people have the stress balls in their pockets you you were always had a piece of artwork yeah. being ready to be carved out from your pockets yeah there's like a, a little bit of anxiety in me i think that keeps me wanting to like have it in my hands on some mm. not a little bit of anxiety it might be a lot a lot okay well it's a good way to channel isn't it to channel that anxiety yeah. into something it puts our focus into being creative yeah yeah Thanks. well tell me about the transformation of your place. You were telling us a little bit about it, how you found the place years ago, 
And I'm looking at the picture of what it once looked like, and I now know what it looks like. So tell me about that whole transformation into your home and gallery and studio. Well, I was studio shopping for a very long time, but as a sculptor, you need a lot of different rooms because you need a room for mold making. I was a potter. I needed a pottery room and woodworking, welding, patinas. Um, so you need a lot of space. So I kept looking at studio rentals and it seemed like I would have to rent like six studios to do what I do. Mm-hmm. And a, um, a friend of mine said, how's it going? I said, well, you know, I've been studio shopping for about six months and I'm kind of stressed. I'm not finding anything to meet my needs. And mm-hmm. I said, how's it going with you? And she says, well, I'm closing my business and I'm selling my building and I'm listing it on Thursday. And I said, oh, that's really sad. And then about a minute later, I said, wait a minute. <laughs> Why did I take a look at your building? <laughs> <laughs> it might be just the perfect thing I'm looking for. <laughs> and I went there and had so many different rooms. It was from 1895 and it, it's been chopped up into this room and that room. And I thought, well, there's all my different studios, but I don't have a place to live. Uh-huh. So it was a matter of cutting off the roof and raising the roof and adding a living space on top. And that space is so cool. I mean, with all the windows and the view uh, throughout Minneapolis. I mean, to build a place up, that was brilliant that you could do that. Yeah. I have a passion for remodeling. My parents were never afraid of taking a sledgehammer and knocking down a wall. And I inherited that. Oh, okay. It wasn't like, don't make a mess that we can't figure our way out of. Nothing is holding you back, basically. You have an idea and you just go for it and see what happens with it. Yeah, being rates fearless. Mm. And what did they do that they kind of had that personality trait? My father was an electrician, and my mom helped in his business. But Mm. they just weren't afraid to remodel. And they they bought property up north, and they completely were always building onto it and remodeling. So that was a big inspiration for me. Mm -hmm. Was it like entrepreneurial in its nature? It wasn't related to their business. It was one of their side passions. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Cool. So you uh, built this place and it is, it's interesting. We walk in the front door and there's all your beautiful work, like a 10, 12 foot space. You look to the right and there's your kitchen and your <laughs> and your living room and your living space. And then you could you can see from the gallery down the stairs into these rooms you're talking about. And it's just all right there. The selling, the work, the living, it's all part of it's all part of you. Because I'm a potter, I make my own dishes, I'm a welder, I make the stools and the paper towel holders. And what I want is the whole place to be kind of made by me. It definitely feels that way. So you said upstairs now, you don't live upstairs anymore. Now you use that space for Airbnbs? Mm -hmm. I had three kids and when they were growing and gone, it was a big space. Mm. I I had roommates for a little while, but the Airbnb is really great. Mm. Extra money and I get to meet people and I get to meet people from all over the world. And I have a big circle of friends that's very international. Mm. It's really great. And I kind of lonely when it's not booked, which is very rare because it's kind of a... A demand Airbnb. Not only is it kind of a place to stay in Minneapolis, it's got your artwork, it's got people's artwork you've collected, it's brightly colored, it's designed really cool. I mean, I imagine it is a really interesting place for people to stay and experience. Yeah. When did you start the Airbnb? Was that before COVID? I'm starting my fourth year right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's nice income and it took a lot of the stress of the art world and the ups and downs of the art world because we all know what a roller coaster ride that can be. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's a nice revenue stream to have coming in. Yes. It leveled my income so I wasn't worried. And the art's kind of mad money now, so it's fun. Oh, that's cool. That's awesome. So um, what have you been working on in the studio these days? Well, let's see. Um, I made some stools for my kitchen. Oh. I <laughs> I finished another three foot Humpty today that I'm actually I chopped off his arms and legs to make uh, separate molds. Okay, so I'll start molds on the Humpty tonight, and then. So um, are those appendages added? They're not. They're not part of the initial casting. I usually do two molds. I I do kind of a down and dirty mold when it's in clay, but then mm-hmm. I like to metal finish it because I have smooth finishes on my work because it looks more cartoony. Mm-hmm. Then I'll mm-hmm. metal finish it and take another mold 
And that's why I chop off the appendages and to make the, the, the second mold. And then I'll weld it all back together. And then I'll have the really good mold so I won't have to do as much work in wax and okay. welding the next time. Um, for those people who aren't familiar with your work, they will immediately know who you are by describing the fact that you are the Humpty Dumpty lady, the bronze Humpty Dumpties. <laughs> <laughs> You've been making eggs for how many years now? Um, 41. 41 years. And how did that come about? How did you start making those? Well, back in the old days, I was dressed up as a jester and did the Renaissance Fair and sold dragon mugs. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> my, so I was doing a lot of work in my pottery studio, and my two-year-old son said, Mom, will you make me a Humpty Dumpty? And I thought, well, you know, I can make that egg shape on the potter's wheel. Uh -huh. Put a little money slot in the top so it was a bank, and I did the arms and legs. They were just wildly popular. Right off the bat, people people were, yeah. were just, it was hot, yeah. a hot item. Yeah. But it, it's a lot of sculpting, so then, oh, you know, break a finger, you break a foot off, you know, you just clank them together the wrong way and they're broken. And I was like, damn it, I'm going to make something that doesn't break. So <laughs> I started, I started really small by taking a mold of a chicken egg. Okay. And doing it, and carving it in wax. And they sold right away the small ones. And uh -huh. then I just started making them really big. And now the biggest one I've made is probably six or seven feet tall. Whoa. I mean, when you first made that transition from clay and in, into metal and you started small, I, I assume part of that was just, you know, learning a new material and stuff. But did you kind of think, I don't know, I guess I kind of think when we started in glass, I'm like, oh, who's going to want to pay for a really big one of these? And then as we start working in the medium and the demand grows and you're like, I guess there is a market for those bigger pieces out there. And, and you know, it surprises us. Yeah, I, th I think it's probably a, our middle class background. Like we forget mm -hmm. there, that there's people that want a, a statement piece. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's not in the world that I've lived in. But yeah, I, I see it. And it's great. And I'm so glad that we get the support that we get. It's awesome. It is. It's totally awesome. So you didn't start in bronze. You started in ceramics. Or tell me about how you got into mm -hmm. art. Uh, I was a potter. I started doing art really young, and I, I actually started welding in high school in the art department because I wanted to take it in the welding department, but I'm 64. When I was in high school, girls couldn't take welding. We couldn't take auto. We couldn't take wood. We <laughs> couldn't even take photography. It was in the boys' wing. Really? <laughs> boys could not take home Mac. <laughs> um, that doesn't sound very inclusive. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't. I mean, imagine if you're like this flaming gay guy and you wanted to be a clothing designer and you can't even learn to sell. You know? uh -huh. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, it was really, really not good stuff. So it actually started me in a political group too because I organized protests and I had sit-ins in front of the principal's office. This was, yeah, this was high school, you say, right? This is high school, yeah. Oh. So in junior high school, I started having sit-ins so that we could take shop classes. There was only like three of us interested, so the students <laughs> were pretty small. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you were an activist early on. You were like, you were well, willing to, to stand behind a, a cause that was important to you. Oh, yes. I was a very early feminist. That's great. You told me once, I saw something where you said that 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 welding class looked interesting, that there was something about it that looked like a room full of janitors that was just so intriguing. You wanted to find out what was going on in there. <laughs> yes, that was actually metal casting in college. I was, I started welding. I kept welding in college, but there was this one room full of guys. I yeah. didn't know what they were. And I finally said, what is that? I see them every day at the same time. So I was, I thought it was work study boys or something. And I uh -huh. said, oh, that's casting. Well, I never knew what casting was. So I went back and read about it. And it's like, oh, I'm going to start casting metal. So um, uh -huh. I busted into that because I have to be different. That's the thing that put it all together. My photography and pottery. It's like Once I started taking casting, it kind of encompassed all that because you had positive, negative space. And plus mm -hmm. you got to do all the sculpting. And it's such a gas pouring hot metal. <laughs> It's really mm. fun. 
with photography, what what kinds of things were you, you know, doing with photography? What were your subjects? A little more abstract. I always like figurative things, but I like structure and just seeing things differently. Like photographer's eye. Mm-hmm. And I still love photography, and there's a lot of great photography out there, but I liked pouring hot metal more than I liked photography. So. Oh, right, right. So one thing we've talked about in the past, you and me, is that you have your hands on almost every stage of the process, which isn't always typical with a lot of other bronze or metal sculptors, that there's maybe a lot of the stages that that they hand off to somebody else to do, the, the grinding, the polishing, or whatever. Tell me about your whole process that goes into building a piece. Well, there is about 15 steps. So, you know, from, from the armature to the sculpture to the mold making, I actually don't do the metal pour part right now, but I get the pieces back together and weld it together. It initially started because I couldn't afford to have to do all that work. Mm -hmm. So it was a way that I cut corners and I had, oh, I had the tiniest little miserable equipment. And, mm. you know, as you sell work, I just kept putting more and more into equipment. And now I got three face power and a 20 horse air compressor. And <laughs> <laughs> so it's grown, it's grown with me. You got the juice. <laughs> yeah. I like, I like finishing metal. I don't know why I could let go of it, but, um, I just can't. I'm drawn to it. It's, I don't know, it's a whole part of the process as much as the sculpting to me. One of the pieces you were working on when we, when Renee and I came to visit you this week was a big Humpty. And it, was it a bronze, the one you were grinding this week? Yeah, that's the one I just finished today and cut off his arms and legs. Okay, because it had such a silvery kind of finish to it. I guess I've always just thought bronze was probably the color that the patina is on it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so that's because I don't know the medium that well. I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, oh, are you working with a different metal? But I didn't I didn't bring that up to you. Is that kind of that shiny silvery look? Is that what bronze looks like right after the pour and when you're grinding at it? Yeah, um, bronze is 95% copper. So think of when you get a brand new penny, how shiny it is. And as mm. soon as you start handling it, it'll start to turn darker and darker. Uh. You know, if, and then if it's laying in the wrong place, it'll turn green or blue green, you know, depending on where it ends up. Like Brancusi's birds are bronze. They're just highly polished. But when you have a really highly polished surface, you can't scratch it. Mm. or you get a big brown scratch eventually once it starts to oxidize from the air. Mm. You know, the gold stuff, it's its hard to maintain, especially when you're doing shows. You can't ever bump into anything with it. It's a real hands-off look. Mm. So I don't do it very much. Um, the finishes that you're using that are brightly colored, is that just paint or is it... Or is it a patina? What 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 gets the the final colors? I do a combination of traditional patinas with chemicals to get mm. the, the kind of French brown look. Mm. That is kind of well, how the brand is going to end up over time anyway. Mm -hmm. But the clothes lend itself to color and acrylic paint. It's kind of what makes me stand out as being unique. Mm. Um, is all my bright colors because mm -hmm. a lot of people don't do that. But now they're finding out that the really ancient Roman sculptures were brightly painted. It just kind of wore off. And, they wore off. Oh. And yeah. Yeah. And then now we patina them to look like these antique green things when they really weren't antique green things. They were painted like paintings. Wow. That's awesome. Um, the thing I notice about your work is it's never just a Humpty Dumpty. It's not just a character. There's a story. There's a pun that that accompanies each piece. Something is happening there. Your work is punny, as they say. <laughs> there goes the Irish in me, yeah. That's the Irish? <laughs> yes, the Irish. I like the hard work, the hard work in Irish, and I, I, I think I'm funny. <laughs> <laughs> you are. <laughs> <laughs> and usually I think of the pun before I even start sculpting the egg. So I have, uh. I have a list, and I could make eggs forever. I do try to balance it with my figurative feminine work hmm. that um, I don't know, just to kind of keep me centered. But yeah, the, the eggs are, they're fun. And I have some new ones coming out that are going to be hilarious. 
Yeah. I'm getting more bold now. I mean, I'm making more statements about society. I'm, I'm not being afraid to insult as much as before. I kept them nice. Yeah. A few years ago, yeah. you actually took some political stabs there with your work. You went there. Yep. And I'm proud of it. <laughs> and a little <laughs> Trumpy Dumpty series. <laughs> Trumpy Dumpty. I yeah. guess my favorite is the uh, Trumpy Dumpty tweeting on the toilet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on his throne. <laughs> well, did you ever get yourself in any trouble? Did anybody ever come in and give you an earful for having oh, a yeah. you know, differing Lots opinion? But the, pro the, the problem with that is I, I kind of a political junkie. Like I listen to public radio nonstop and mm. I can respond to those people with a lot of facts. And okay. if they want to give me trouble, I'll just give it right back. <laughs> <laughs> You're not afraid. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. You'd learn history and you just, you don't kind of want to, uh, I don't know, these people that make a mess of things, it's um, it's sad and they have a lot of followers and it's, it's our job as artists to speak up and say something. It's not like you're starting a fight though. You are expressing a point of view and it may not be everybody else's point of view. I guess what happens is sometimes people just want to like have their knee jerk reactions, which can which can be uncomfortable, but you're still being true to your your political voice and your and your voice as an artist. Yeah, and I did have a lot of friends like warn me not to do that. I was putting myself at risk, but I said, you know what? If if I don't say something, who's gonna say something? Like we have to say something. It's our job mm. as artists, and so nobody's mm. gonna fire me. That's I'm, right. I already fired myself all kinds of times, and I keep coming back. <laughs> you keep you keep rehiring yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Damn it! Nobody else will do it. I guess I'm gonna have to go do it. <laughs> oh, another pink slip. Oh, well, I was just the employee of the month yesterday, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, where did you get your start learning to be an artist? Did Did you go to the U of M? Was that what I, what I remember? Uh, I went to the, um, I, you know, I started at minor state co colleges and then mm -hmm. um, transferred to the U because, well, I was a potter and, uh, you know, there's some famous potters there and Warren McKenzie, that's the reason I went to the U. Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, w when I went into broadcast casting, their, their casting students were just horrendous and oh. they're really quite wonderful now, but I kind of missed all that. You were before the times where they, they had the equipment and everything that was, they have better stuff now? Yeah, I think the art department had some really good deans that did a lot of fundraising and the art department really got developed after I left. I like, you know, I still have really fond memories of the dumpy old art department. Mm, cool. I know we focus a bit on your, your Humpty Dumpty series, but you do have a whole other line of work of figurative pieces of women in yoga poses and female forms. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that is, you know, that's work that's really personal to me as, as a feminist and I, I am an athlete and mm -hmm. I just, I like making strong women, you know, not, they're not there waiting to get laid or whatever. <laughs> you know, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that. You can say that. This is this podcast. You can say anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're not. They're not Playboy centerfolds. They're they're strong and they're powerful and they have some muscles and they have things to say and they have attitude and um, I combine mm -hmm. a lot of nature things. I I put in some fire. My last piece is called "Woman in the Wave" and she's mm -hmm. um, surrounded by a big wave. I, I don't know. It's so it, it references a lot of stuff. So I, I know that you use a lot of motion, like dancing and yoga in a lot of your poses with, with the female forms. It's because I do yoga and I love dance. And I, I'm 64. I just got done playing hockey an hour ago. So. Wow. You are an athlete. I, yeah. I know you're into golf too, aren't you? Yeah. I love golf. It's really good for your mental focus. Do you ever sit still? I mean, did I catch you at a, at a rare moment when you could sit still and talk? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad <laughs> if you're not working or driving to a show or you're on the move. Yeah, my studio's in my house, so as soon as we're done, I'll go downstairs and work on that mold. You know, that's the advantage of having your studio in your house. Even when I lived in St. Paul, my studio was behind your house, but if it was forty below, you're kinda like, Oh, I have to like 
get in the cold and go to my studio and thought, well, this, you just go downstairs, you know, you throw in a load of laundry and you mix a batch of rubber <laughs> and you can get a lot done. It's just intermixed in your life. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. So the different rooms you're talking about with your work, you've got a room for polishing and grinding your pieces. But then we went around to the front of the building. It's almost like walking into the wax museum. It's so cool to see all of these pieces you're making or have made over the years, just kind of like sitting all on top of each other. And <laughs> it's insane. It is not insane in a bad way. It's insane in a cool way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I take it all for granted because my mind is always on the, you know, 15 pieces that I want to make before the end of this year. <laughs> So I forget about the last one. So what do you have planned for this year? Do you have some shows coming up in Florida? I have Coconut Grove in Naples. It's your first show of the Grove? Yeah. Okay. Yep. We'll see you down there. Yeah, yeah. we'll, we'll okay. do a little uh, tag team. You'll pass me and you, I'll never catch up. So. <laughs> yeah. And you, you, you do need to take, take up golf so we can do some golfing during the week when we're down there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would love that. You know, I actually tried golf with my uncles uh, several years ago when I was doing more like a season. And so I'd stay down there and we'd golf and I was an embarrassment. I mean, maybe if I had a little oh, bit God. more coaching, I just hit that oh. baby in the wrong direction and they'd get so irritated with me. <laughs> Doug, I've done triathlons. I play hockey. I played rugby. I played, I don't know what sports I've done. Golf is the hardest sport I've ever done. It is so oh, really? hard. Yeah. And you like it because it's hard, right? I do. Yeah, I do. Well, I have a kind of an obsessive compulsive disorder, so it gives me like a lot. Like think about. Does it make you kind of hone in a bit? Kind of like channel and calm and center? It's a game of micro milliliters, you know, if your club's this way or that way or mm -hmm. it's not. Your backswing, like there's a million factors that make you hit that sweet spot, and and really, a thousand things can go wrong. And I, the people that are great at it, is like wow, just because they practice, practice, practice. Well, I guess it does take a real like body awareness to know exactly like how your your leg is turned or your hip is turned as you do your swing and all that kind of stuff. And when you break, and you know, it's just like art. Exactly like art. You know, you think of like blowing glass and just that, how you may push a color out to the edge just mm -hmm. by, you, you know, you take for granted your skills probably, but just the way you will do a twist will will swirl a color a certain way or mm -hmm. how and when you pick up the color, or, you know, things like that. Yeah. So, so when you are, when you're in between shows, is that what you do? Do you golf? Yeah, I golf or I go kayak with the manatees or I don't know what I do. A lot of times I lay around a lot, <laughs> which okay. is unusual for me. I think, do we, will you go out for like a couple shows and then you have like time in between where you can chill, like go to the beach or go golf or kayak or whatever? Yeah, I'll do that. This show, I'm just, I'm actually going to the Grove and flying back on Wednesday and then I'm not, mm -hmm. and I'm going to fly back before Naples because. Mostly because I've been working really hard, and, and I I just want a, like a little month just to kind of chill and be home. Yeah, and I I'm a af I'm afraid that I'll I'll be bored down in Florida. I'll get bored. I got bored. Boring. I don't fish. Yeah. I don't know what you can do. You know, the restaurants suck. <laughs> well, Ten minutes on the beach, and then I'm like, okay, can I be doing something now? <laughs> You know what I mean? Okay, this is beautiful. I'm getting a sunburn. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, so what? what do you people do? You just lay here? <laughs> just is that lay what here. You do? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, no. I know. And then there, it's so touristy and pharmacies on every corner. And I don't know. It's weird. <laughs> yeah. But the other thing that it hit me years ago when I thought, well, flying home is so expensive. But then when I thought about the amount of money I was making in the studio and the money I wasn't spending on hotel rooms, it made like, it was like a no brainer then. It was like, no, it makes yeah. total sense to fly home. And I got round trip tickets for $168. Did you have points or what? How did you get them that cheap? No, I don't know. Just the dates were right. Flying at five in the morning or? Actually, I'm not, but it's spirit. 
<laughs> Having Minneapolis airport right there, I mean, you can fly pretty affordably. Fort Myers is a direct one to Minneapolis, Fort Lauderdale, Tampa, they're all direct flights. So it's pretty easy. Fort Myers is my favorite airport in the whole country. It, mine too. It's just small enough that it's just like you're in and out. Yeah, it's really yeah. simple. Yeah, you just park mm-hmm. and go. You know, I'm not applying to as many as I used to mm. so that I could stay home and get things done. And that's one thing that COVID did is it sort of made me focus on, you know, our mortality and our limited time and, and how much you can get done when things are really kind of calm and, and you're not mm-hmm. running off to an art show and working on reproductions, reproductions, reproductions. It was just kind of amazing to look at the body of work that I created. Just because I could make whatever I wanted, not what I needed. And I really, really like that feeling. So I'm going to stick to that a little more. That's an interesting point that is a common theme with a lot of people we've talked to. Is once we got off of that grind, the first fear is like, oh my God, how are we going to make it through this period of time off? But then we realized just how we didn't need that intense schedule to keep going, that we could have some balance. So That's great that you're able to think of other things that you actually need to do and where you want to put your focus. And I know that feeling like like you're describing where you're constantly trying to fill the inventory of the thing you think you need to sell at the next show that was before COVID. But now we are able to just be busy and make the things you want to make. It's a whole different. It's like being ahead of the game. Yeah, just express ourselves. And I feel blessed being an older artist. The younger artists have a harder time of it because we're far enough ahead in life that our homes are paid for and our vehicles are paid for. And, you know, if you're starting out, I mean, it's expensive getting a new van or a new tent. And and then if COVID hit, it would just bankrupt you. Yeah, it all depends on timing. That's true. Yeah. So talk to me about other means of selling your work because I know that you have a lot of your work out in the public, like a lot of public art, corporate art, you know, you have sculptures in town squares and that sort of thing. Do those things come to you from the art fairs or was there like a whole separate way of attracting these types of of buyers? Well, the first one came out of the Coconut Grove Art Fair where a city, Mm -hmm. they do these lease programs for sculptures. They don't pay very much and it's like $500 and you paid $5,000 $5,000 for the metal that's in your piece. I agreed to it, but they liked it and they bought it. A sale. And so that one led to another one, which led to another one, which led to another one. Plus, as you know, I have a lot of inventory in my house. <laughs> Some of those <laughs> eggs are, are pretty big. So I started yeah. putting those in the lease programs. Oh. And my work is really popular, so it wins a lot of people's choices because it appeals to people of all ages, especially children who, who like to vote. And so I got a lot of sales from doing that. Um, do you need a drink of water? <clears throat> yeah, I do you have sounded a sounded like you might be dry. Yeah, go yeah. ahead and take a break and grab a glass of water. And then, you know, when you live alone, this is probably the most I've talked in a year. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about your life. (laughs) (laughs) So let me see if I understand you right. Did you say that the first kind of foray into public art like that started from the Grove? They give you pennies on the dollar of what you're really asking for a piece. And that was just to kind of get your foot in the door Yeah, with having that exposure. Yeah. So I, you know, I knew about those programs, but I was like, poo poo, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to do it. Because it's like, well, mm-hmm. for what I'm paying for my work. But now I I have enough of them out there that I can rotate them through. If they don't sell, then it goes to the next city, which you get another $1,000 for. And then, then it goes to the next city and you get another 1000 And pretty soon your piece is paid for, but you still have it. But usually by the time I get to that point, one of the cities will buy it. Okay. So a city will lease it for a certain amount of money for a certain amount of time. And then once their term is up, you might lease it to a different city square. And then so you're getting paid for it, for it to be on display. And then eventually somebody will buy it for seeing it out and about. But then you're also getting paid for people to have it out there. So it kind of eventually pays for itself that way too. Right. 
And uh, I, like I said, I'm pretty lucky because the, the kids like my work. And so I, I also win a lot of prizes too, like cash prizes. Mm. It's kind of a second business as, as much as art fairs. How many pieces would you say, you know, ballpark that you have out there on this kind of program? Sold and leased, probably at least maybe 25. Okay. That's interesting. That's really cool. And they have to be, yeah, they have to be large. So, I mean, you can't mm-hmm. put my small work out there. Right. What would be considered a larger piece? Well, their minimum is 24 inches. Most of my work is like between 40 and 50 inches. You're everywhere, Kimber. It's so interesting. I've got a friend from college who was traveling somewhere. I don't know where he was, but he had his profile picture of himself with his hand on his hip next to one of your Humpties doing doing one of the Humpty poses. And I'm like, yeah, my funny. friend makes that. You know, and then I'm sitting a number of years ago before Trump was president, we used to watch The Celebrity Apprentice. And all of a sudden, across the TV screen is like 25 of your Humpties, The Apprentice. (laughs) You didn't know that was going to happen, did you? I didn't know it was going to happen. My phone blew up. I didn't even know who Donald Trump was. So I watched the show the next week to see who he was. And I thought, this guy's an asshole. He's mean. I don't want to be associated with him. So I contacted a lawyer and I found out that I signed a release for my work to be on his show. (laughs) (laughs) Little did you know, that started this relationship. (laughs) One of the drawbacks would be busy. (laughs) Yeah, you're like, what do you want me to sign? Okay, fine. Okay, yeah, fine. Let me have it. Okay. Oh, man. It's just bizarre. We have such a, a, a reach and a spread. You just never know where your stuff's going to end up, who, who's going to have it, who's going to see it, what celebrities come across it. Have you had any other situations with celebrities like that? Yeah, I, I think we all have. The The problem with me is I don't watch TV. I, like I'm on, the, I'm on the radio all the time. So, mm. I mean, if somebody does come up, like if Oprah came to my gallery, I'd say, hi. What brings you here? Where are you from? What's your name? <laughs> I want you to know. <laughs> Should be yeah. like, uh, don't you know who I am? <laughs> I had a picture from a, a collector on my office store for years because they built a pool like kind of around my Humpty. Somebody said, is that Tony Hawkins? Yeah, who's that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know. And they said, so you met him? I said, yeah, he was going by with his kids were in a stroller and he kicked this kid out of the stroller and he put my humpy in. He walked away. <laughs> of course, he paid me for it, but, but yeah. I didn't, I just still don't know. I wouldn't know. Yeah. So you did the Ren Fest uh, to start. Was that the first way that you started selling your work was through there or had you been doing art fairs before that? Or tell me about that. Yeah, I, I started um, doing the Uptown Art Fair when it was little card tables. I think it costed me $40 and I was on Lake Street. <laughs> so, and then the Dinah Art Fair, just making little coffee mugs and stuff like that. So I started there. Somebody walked up to me at Uptown and said, oh, you should do the Renaissance Fair. And I was like, what's that? So I did it and um, it was pretty good business for a while. What years was that? Oh, that would have been in the 80s. Yeah, in the okay. 80s. Yeah, but it was great. I mean, it paid paid for my car. I got some new kilns. I, I built my business really organically through small shows up to the bigger shows. Was that at a time when there were a lot of Twin Cities folks who were there? I mean, who were some of the other peers that were at the Run Fest at that time? Like I know Duke and Ledez oh, were there back then. Duke and Ledez. There was a lot of glass blowers, a lot of potters. Well, I'm old enough that most people have retired now. So um We did talk to Jay McDougal last season. He talked about him and Cindy were there for a brief stint at the Minnesota Renaissance Fair. So yeah, I know that a bunch of people from around here that that was that was a start for them. Tell me about how you said it started to turn, though, that, that it made it hard to sell because of things that the that they were doing there. Oh, the management started making their own kiosks with their own kind of imported work that kind of competed against the potters. And, and then also the art fairs. There wasn't very many art fairs. I mean, 
when when I was young, it was like Edina and Uptown. Now there's art fairs everywhere in every city. In the beginning, there was just a few of us artists, and there was a few shows, and now it's a whole industry. When would you say you started leaving the area to do shows? When did you branch out? I missed the really big days, because um, I, I took a break for a little while, and I had a little restaurant gallery along Lake Pippin for a while, because I really? still like to cook. Yeah, so I had a gallery okay. restaurant. When I came out of that, and I had this building and I had a gallery here, but the gallery didn't really support me very well. Mm. Somebody came in and said, why don't you do the Beverly Hills Art Fair? And I said, like, oh, really? So I, I drove all the way to Beverly Hills. I sold every single thing I had, like the first day. So on mm. Monday, I had empty pedestals with no bronzes. And I thought, wow, this is great. Then I I got in the best show in the country. I got in coconut grove and then i got in salsalito and i was like wow it was an amazing world and to see successful artists and they had nice cars and i had a stereotype that it was a broken down bands and you know card tables like the old days yep. and it, yeah yeah no it wasn't it, it was it was amazing to see the success and how well we were treated by the management and it was quite a step up it was great wow that's pretty interesting I didn't know that time. I mean, when I got into it in the early 2000s, shows were very established. There were lots of them. You had lots of choices of where to go. In fact, everybody was telling the tale of what the glory days used to be like. <laughs> yeah. Now I think these now these post-COVID days are becoming the glory days, the days everyone's saying that's when we're really like, you know, coming back out of, from hiding and the sales are, are phenomenal again. It's like they missed us. They really did miss us. They did. <laughs> they took us for granted because we were everywhere. There was, you know, it's like, oh, ho, hum, there they are again, you know, <laughs> oh, shutting down our city streets. Oh, dear. We have to drive around them. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're like, where did they go? We miss you. <laughs> Plus, they have a lot more money, too, because they weren't spending it on anything. They weren't going out to eat. They weren't traveling. They were sitting mm -hmm. home in their house for two years going, oh, I could use a nice piece of art over there in that left corner. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing how everybody started painting walls, and that changed everything. It just started a whole new remodeling, which meant they needed yeah. new stuff. Which we're yeah. happy about. I know we're happy about it. <laughs> How yeah. long will it last? I don't know. You know. Yeah. So know. you told me one time that you knew, even as a little girl, that you were going to be an artist. You didn't know what that meant, but you knew that art was going to be your career. Artist was your archetype. That was you. How did you know yeah. that so early on? You know, you got me. I don't know. I used to go down to the sand hill and I would just sculpt in sand all day long. I would draw all the time. I would make tables, like abstract wood tables when I was little. I could even hammer nails. And I don't know. I just, I just knew that that was where I found my joy. Mm. And no exposure, like never been to an art museum, no art books on the shelf, no great aunts who are artists or I don't know. I'm pretty blessed. It was just that desire to be making stuff, that desire to create and express. Is Are you mm -hmm. saying, is that where it really came from, an internal place? Yeah. My mom had these Time Life books on Egypt and Rome, and I would just read them over and over just to see the statues in them, just pick them up and keep looking at them. That was your jam. That's what it Yeah, that's, it's my jam. <laughs> that's what got you going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why is art important? I mean, you've devoted your life to it, to creating you live in a place where you can create. It's so integrated with getting up every day, making food to sustain yourself, but then your ability to then just go, like you said, throw in a load of laundry and work on your art. You've got your gallery up front. You've got your van right there that you can throw the stuff in there and drive cross country. It's just so all-encompassing. I guess that's the thing I find so interesting about you is it really is such a deeply rooted part of you. You know, my level of passion is really high. Even my professor in college told me that. Like, you can tell what students are going to make it because you can just tell they're the first one to turn on the lights in the morning and mm. they're the last ones to turn them off at the end of the day. And that was me. Wow, that's really cool. 
this is fun. This has been a fun talk. I really, I really liked hearing about you and what kind of makes you tick and, and why you do what you do it. But I'm just really impressed with that drive. I can relate to that drive that you have that not because anybody is, is telling you to do it. It's, it's that internal thing that you just, you would do it if somebody held you back. You'd be like, I'm, I'm going to go through and I'm going to yeah. do it. <laughs> yeah. When, when times were hard, I thought, well, you know, they're so hard. If, if I had to rob a bank, I wouldn't mind. As long as they have an art department at the Chesapeake Women's Prison, I wouldn't care. <laughs> so a, either, so either, either I got away with the money and I could, I could pay some of my bills. <laughs> Before I get caught, I have access to our department 24-7. <laughs> you, saw, you saw the bright side and whatever whatever outcome, at least you had art in your life. <laughs> and you don't know, maybe uh, I really did that and got away with it. <laughs> I got away with it, perhaps you did. <laughs> Kimberly, well, I'm looking forward to seeing you down in Miami. Have uh, Have a safe drive and thanks for taking the time to sit and chat with me. Yeah, it was really fun. Yeah, I look forward to hitting the road again. And you know, when you when you're on the road, you're like, oh god, I, I don't want to do this. And then and then as soon as you're home, you're like, you're only home like two weeks. Now where can I go? Yeah, <laughs> I have to go I, somewhere. Waiting yeah. for the next one. You <laughs> yeah. know what I find really? I don't know if anyone else experiences this, but the lead up to getting out to a show or a run of a couple of shows. There is such a drive. There's such a frenetic kind of a panic of, am I going to get it all done? Am I going to get it all in the van? And then we get it all in the van. We rush, we rush, we rush. And then we sit behind the wheel and we just sit there and we just drive for two or three yeah. days. You know what I mean? And We're, it's just like yeah. such a different We're, reality. Isn't it wonderful? Just listen to books. I just love it. It's so calm. And then you get to a show after you've been sitting, 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 sitting. And then you have to be like physically like ready to do the hardest little physical stuff. And then, yeah, you're just like run, 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 run again. (laughs) Or then you break down your booth and your beat, and then you have to sit in your butt and do nothing. There's no transition between the physical labor and the... And the no. And your physical labor, I mean, you're lugging around all these heavy pieces. Are you usually traveling with assistance or do you hire people when you get there? How do you get everything moved around? I have been voted several times as the most athletic artist because <laughs> people watch <laughs> me slip this. They watch me lift this stuff. <laughs> you know, I think after sitting in a show for a couple of days and I sit there and you can tell I'm not a sitter. Like... I look forward to the breakdown. Like I look forward to the work and loading my truck because it's like it's like going to the gym to me. <laughs> it's a workout. It's a it's physical yeah. motion. Yeah. The sitting still is more of a torturous feeling than the actual like lifting and moving and yep. being active, right? <laughs> you got it. Uh you're a good guy. I like what you do. You're living the dream too. You know, you're living, breathing art. It's really cool. Oh, that's cool. Awesome. Well, thanks, Kimber. I really appreciate your your talking with me today. Thank you. It was great to talk to you, Doug. All right. Bye. Right. Now I can make noise in the background, right? <laughs> yes, now you can. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard for me not to be tapping my pen. And be, like I, I peeled the paint off this pencil way we're talking. I told you I didn't even say this. So I just... <laughs> Great talk with Kimber Douglas. It's really interesting to hear the voice behind all of those great sculptures that we've seen over the years. Also interesting to see her get a little political over the last few years. Yeah, no kidding. Wasn't that part kind of funny where she says she's so passionate about art that her level of passion is so high that she even would joke that if she had to like rob a bank, that it was still okay with her because then she could just do art in the Shakopee women's prison. I mean, when she (laughs) said that, that actually shocked me. I thought that was so funny. That's amazing. (laughs) Yeah, it's a great talk. So I I appreciate you sitting down and and bringing another voice to some work that we've seen for so many years, right? Yeah, totally. I mean, a long time. Let's think back here. Somebody comes into her booth and says to her at like the Uptown, you should consider going to Beverly Hills and do their show out there. She'd never left the state to do a show. And on a whim, she's like, okay, I'll try it out. Wow. Signs up for the show, drives all the way out to Beverly Hills for the first time cross country, and sells out. 
insane. I mean, that's a whole different world than we're familiar. I mean, we've got social media. We interact with each other. We kind of like carry on these conversations. So are you telling me that when uh, these clients come into our booths and say, have you ever done the Schenectady yeah. uh, ballpark? Baseball Sausage show. Fest. Yeah. Have you, ever, have you ever done the, the Hearing Aid Festival? And, like, My oh, church has we, a really nice just... bazaar in the basement. You're like, oh, I should give that a shot. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Are they on Zap? <laughs> <laughs> great talk, Douglas. I'm going to get back into the studio, see what I can come up with. I've got some great ideas that I think I can get outside of my brain and onto the canvas. So we'll see where that takes awesome. me. Hey, who who do we have coming up next week? Who did you talk to? I talked to a good friend, uh, Mark Winner. So inspiring talk from Mark. And I'm excited for y'all to, to hear him. He's a funny guy and uh, interesting guy and, and really organized creator. So I'm excited for that one. Totally. I loved your talk and I can't wait for everyone to hear it next week. So best of luck to you out in the studio. I am going to limp my way down to the living room and flip on Netflix. So I'm going to be taking it easy for a couple of days. Good luck, my friend, and good luck to Renee on dealing with you in pain, the caged animal with your foot in a trap. I envy either one of you. Hang in there, my friend. We'll see you (laughs) next time. All right. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. This podcast is brought to you by the National Association of Independent Artists. The website is naiaartists.org. Also sponsored by Zapplication. That's zapplication.org. And while you're at it, check out Will's website at willarmstrongart.com and my website at sigwithglass.com. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast to be notified when we release new episodes. 